We're moving into the rest of chapter 12. And so if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to John chapter 12. Uh, You ever get like a special thing uh, delivered to your house, or maybe it's a special food or something like that that you really like that comes to the house, or maybe somebody in your house makes really good food, like there is in my house. I have somebody that makes really good food that I like to enjoy. And so like you'd all know that Karen's a great cook. And so, and I'm a great eater. So we have this really good compatible relationship, right? Like she loves to cook, I love to eat. So it all works out. Uh, but sometimes she makes something really special that I like to eat and I don't want to share, right? Do you ever get like something special like that that you just don't want to share and so you hide it away? Right? Like you, you kind of put it away where nobody else, especially like if the grandkids are up or if you have teenagers in your house, good luck hiding anything because they can smell food a mile away, right? But sometimes I just like to hide that away, and and so I'll put it like in a disguised package in the back of the fridge where only I know where it is, you know. Karen can't reach the back of the fridge, so I know I'm safe uh, if I put it on the top shelf in the back. She can't get there, so so I'm good there. I can just put it in there, and I can enjoy it all myself. I can just take one small piece and savor it every day. But you know what, what oftentimes happens when I do that? I forget about it. And then like a month later, I'm like, what's this package back here? And it looks nothing like what she originally made. Like it's it's grown into something else. And it's it's lost. I, I've I've lost all of that savory goodness because you know I may try it even with a I'll scrape the fuzz off and but it never tastes quite this right, like it just isn't the same. Sometimes when I try to protect what is mine, I end up losing it altogether. And that's what Jesus wants to to talk to us about this morning in John chapter 12. We're going to pick up with verse 12 where we left off last week. Um, So remember, we had Lazarus' resurrection, and then last week we talked about uh, Mary anointing Jesus with this valuable perfume, and now we're right after that. The next day... The news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city, and a large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. And they shouted, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy, but after Jesus had entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Now many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. And that was the reason that so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. And then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do, look, Everyone has gone after him. Now, some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus. And Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. And Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me, because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. And then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. And when the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder. Well, Others declared an angel had spoken to him. And then Jesus told them, The voice was for your benefit, not mine. 
The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. The crowds responded, We understood from the scripture that the Messiah would live forever. How can you say the Son of Man will die? Just who is this Son of Man anyway? And Jesus replied, My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time, and then you will become children of the light. Now, After saying these things, Jesus went away and was hidden from them. But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe in him. Now, This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? But the people couldn't believe, for as Isaiah also said, the Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so that their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he spoke this, because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Many people did not believe in him. However, including some of the Jewish leaders, or excuse me, many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders. But they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Jesus shouted to the crowds, If you trust me, you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I will not judge those who hear me but don't obey me for I have come to save the world and not to judge it. But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I say whatever the Father tells me to say. Let's pray. God, this morning as we study your word and we hear this powerful message from Jesus, I pray that you would help us to submit ourselves to the word. To submit ourselves to the voice of your spirit as you speak into our hearts this morning. That you would draw us close and that we would be willing to be drawn close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So our story this morning begins with Palm Sunday. We're just actually a few weeks on the calendar away from Palm Sunday, the day that we celebrate Jesus coming into Jerusalem and all of the crowds uh, really excited about what God is doing and what Jesus in particular is doing John reminds us that Lazarus is still on everybody's mind and this wonderful miracle of life overcoming death is is propelling the crowd to want to come out and to uh, seek Jesus and to experience more of his power and more of his blessing, more of what he can do in life. And and they they have an agenda for what Jesus should do. Like they they have plans for how Jesus' power can continue to bring freedom and liberty and life to them, right? Like, like they know that, all right, here's Jesus, and this guy can do stuff that we cannot do. This man can do things that we've been trying to do for a long time and have been unsuccessful. And so let's support him because if we can support him and get him into our kind of agenda, imagine what can happen, right? Like imagine how far we can go if Jesus is on our team. Right, like you just kind of put yourself like if you're back in elementary school picking teams for dodgeball, right? Like who are you picking, right? Like if you have like you know the really big athletic kid that can throw like 90 mile an hour fastballs in sixth grade, like you want him on your dodgeball team, right? Like and so you're gonna go and you're you're gonna run out. This is kind of like how people are looking at Jesus. Like this is the man who can do stuff we can't do. And so they're rallying around him. 
ready to stand up whenever Jesus gives them the word and, and go forward and throw off the Romans. That was the big thing, right? Get rid of the Romans. Jewish freedom, Jewish liberty, restore Jerusalem. Even the Pharisees have been working at this. Now, they've been doing it politically, right? The Pharisees have been working pragmatically and politically. They've been trying to, uh, you know, diplomatically create a, a situation where, where Israel is going to be able to kind of reemerge and at least have some kind of shared power. They understand that they're probably never going to be able to really defeat Rome, to throw off Roman rule, but they've been working actively to diplomatically move things forward. And now, with Jesus on the scene, it's like, what more can we do, they say? Everyone has gone after him. Our way has failed. And the religious leaders have, have given up. Jesus seems to be ready to accomplish what they've been working at for decades, ruining all their progress, and all the people are giving him the praise and paying attention to him instead of paying attention to them. Even outsiders are joining in the cause, right? Like we see John tells us that there's some Greeks who come and they want to meet Jesus and they want to get into this and they want to be part of this glorious movement that's going to make a change in history. But Jesus has a totally different agenda, doesn't he? Like Jesus is not caught up in all of this frenzy and all of this excitement and all of this politics. He's not caught up in any of that. He says that it is time for his glory to come, right? Like verse 20, 23, he says, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. And everybody, probably if he had stopped the speech right there, everybody would have been like, yes! Right? Like they would have been ready to do whatever he asked them to do. But Jesus doesn't stop the speech there. He has a different plan in mind. And when he tells them the plan, you can just see the wind going out of this whole movement, right? Like everyone's like, oh, we thought we'd gotten past this. But what does Jesus say? He says that his glory is not about living, but dying. And he gives us this little parable here of a grain of wheat. Right now, I, I grew up on a farm, I still love to farm. There's this farming background in me that many of you know. Some of you are gardeners, and, and so you, you work with seeds and, and things. Right now, if you have a grain of wheat, a grain of wheat is not that big, really. It's pretty small. A little bit bigger than a tomato seed, but smaller than a bean. Right? It's, it's, it's just this little, this little thing. It weighs next to nothing on its own. One little grain of wheat if you were to grind it into flour, you would not have enough to make a pancake or even a crepe. You, you wouldn't have enough to, to do much of anything with. If you were making a soup and you put one grain of wheat in the soup, you know, like sometimes you'll eat barley soup or something like that, you know, if you had one piece of grain of barley or one grain of wheat in your soup, people would be wondering, like, you know, is this stone soup? You know, with just the water and we're imagining that it's got stuff in it? No, you know, it, it's so small. It's in, it doesn't really accomplish anything at all. It's irrelevant, inconsequential. And once it's used up, like once you do grind it up, you know, maybe you have, you know, a thousand grains of wheat, and so you grind up all of those, and now you can make yourself a pancake. You've got enough flour to maybe make a loaf of bread. But once the bread and the flour has been used up, it's, it's gone. Jesus says, if you're willing to take that grain of wheat and put it into the ground, one little grain, that same little grain of wheat, and you, you put it into the ground and bury it, it's gone. It's, it's going to die. It's, it's, but out of that springs a plant. And on that plant, sometimes you'll have 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 grains of wheat. I love to combine wheat. It's one of my favorite things to do. You just see those heads of wheat just rolling into the head of the combine. I, just, I can do that all day and just smile. But you think about one little grain of wheat produced that stalk. It's loaded. Maybe, maybe that long. With four sides of, of grain going up that stalk. 80 or even 100 individual grains of wheat 
that that one plant has produced. It's become so much more. It requires a little more resource, some labor, some fertilizer, some weed control. But the death of the grain of wheat produces an abundant crop. And Jesus describes this, or gives us this parable to describe what's going to happen to him. His death will lead to innumerable followers. One death, an entire kingdom of followers. Jesus' glory is not found in trying to preserve his life. It is found in giving his life. Jesus' glory is not found by the accolades of people, but by God. Look at verse 27 and 28. Jesus says, My soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Verse 28, Father, bring glory to your name. Glory for Jesus meant that God would be glorified. Now, I don't think that Jesus was immune to the praise of other people, like he just didn't feel it or it wasn't attractive to him or anything like that. Like, I do think that that, that was appealing and, and alluring to him, and he probably felt the pressure that people were putting on him to, to do it their way. But for him, the most important thing was God's glory. He was not deterred because he valued what God thought of him more than what he valued what others thought of him. We were talking about this very thing in Sunday school this morning. I I had to like sit on my hands, you know, so I didn't give away the whole sermon in Sunday school. But it makes me ask a question. Do we value what God thinks of us more than we value what other people think of us? Really? Really? Like, honestly, think about that. Who do you value more? Who do you value what they think of you more? How is that lived out in your life? For Jesus, his glory was in what God thought of him, not in what others thought of him. Contrast this to the the group of people that John describes in verses 42 and 43. Here Here we see this group of people that believe in Jesus but are unwilling to profess their belief. Why? Because they're afraid of what other people are going to say about them. They're afraid they're going to get kicked out from the synagogue. Now, now this is no minor threat, right? Like, this is a big deal. We shouldn't minimize the, the pressure that this group of people are facing. For to be kicked out of the synagogue, we might, in our day, say it's equivalent to being uh, fired from your job and given a black dot on your resume such that no one else is going to hire you in that city. That's what they were undergoing. Because if you had gotten kicked out of the synagogue and you went to get a job somewhere and they asked, well, you know, how are things going? And and maybe they called up the rabbi and said, you know, so-and-so wants to work for me. And the rabbi says, yeah, no, they're on the black list. You're not going to get that job. You lose your financial stability, be labeled in a way that would make work hard to get. This was a big deal. And yet, notice what John says. They loved human praise more than the praise of God. They loved what people could do for them more than what God could do for them. They had more trust in what humans could do for them than in what God could do for them. Not so with Jesus. His glory was found in what God thought, not in what others, not in what others thought. And the third thing that I see here in our text here is Jesus is describing this agenda of his is that his glory is not about himself but others. Look at verse 32. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. Jesus embraces the cross and the shame and the ridicule associated with it. We see this in the book of Hebrews where he embraces, the writer of Hebrews says that he embraces the cross, he embraces the agony, he embraces the pain and the suffering because he knew that it would benefit you and me. 
There was an old Christian song that said, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. He was thinking about you and me, not himself. If he was thinking about himself, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have come right down off of that cross like the religious leaders were trying to get him to do, to prove himself. He could have avoided it altogether back at the temptation with with Satan in the wilderness. But he wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. His life's purpose was not to get ahead. It was not to benefit himself and his, his family. His life's purpose was that many would be drawn to God. You know, I've, I think we can only live this way when we first have determined that pleasing God is more important than pleasing people. We really can't fully give ourselves to others if we're still dependent on what they think of us for our self-esteem, for our worth, and our value. Jesus had predetermined that what God thought was most important. And because of that, he was then free to live sacrificially for you and me. And this is how he invites us to live. Look at verse 25 and 26. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me because my servants must be where I am. And so the question I would ask us this morning is, which life do you love? Which life do you want to live? It's interesting to me that we, we seem to be getting increasingly shorter and shorter attention spans. Right? Like, we, we become more focused on the immediate, and our immediate even becomes shorter and shorter. And I think coronavirus has even made this, made us more short-sighted. Like, it's it's harder for us to plan long-term because we're not sure what's going to be open or what the restrictions are going to be, and so so we've kind of even been conditioned in the last year to think even more temporarily, just to think more in the moment, right now. And all of this has pushed us away from thinking about eternity. And I think in our culture, there's a widely held universalist view of eternity. In that Everybody kind of makes it in, in the end anyways. It doesn't really matter how you live this life. It doesn't really matter what you do, we, because pretty much everybody's going to make it anyways. Like, that's kind of how a lot of people believe. And in fact, that's probably how many of us believe. But Jesus has this remarkable statement. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Now, I don't think that Jesus is saying that we should be miserable and depressed and hate life. No, he he talks about he's come to give us life and to give it to the fullest, more abundantly. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And not just in eternity, but I think even now that God values joy and engaging in life and experiencing it fully. But I do think he is talking about what do we value most? Where is our heart? Which life do we love more? The life that is focused on getting ahead financially or securing the best job, the praise and accolades of others, preserving what is ours? Or the life that is about blessing others, God's glory, sacrifice, and generosity? Those who love their life in this world will lose it. those who care nothing for their life in this world. Verse 25. 
will keep it for eternity. Saving your life means that you have to lay it down. Jesus models and teaches us that we save our lives not by protecting them, but by laying them down in service to God and others. Now, this does not mean that you become a doormat and you do what everybody else wants. Jesus does exactly the opposite of what everybody wants him to do. He does what God wants him to do, irregardless of what other people asked or pressured or wanted him to do. So it doesn't mean that we're doormats, but it does mean that we are less concerned about our own protections than we are about modeling the character of Christ. I think sometimes we get really caught up in protecting what is ours. Protecting our beliefs, our rights, the things that we value and appreciate. And I value and appreciate those things, and I want to protect them. But Jesus pushes us to say we should be less concerned about our own protections than we are about modeling his character. People should see more of the fruit of the Spirit in how we live and in how we respond on social media. Right? Like, they shouldn't just see us posting the fruits of the Spirit and, like, this is what the fruit of the Spirit is. They should experience the fruit of the Spirit in how we live and in how we say things and what we're most concerned about. If we're more worried about protecting our own liberties than we are about bringing people into the kingdom of God of laying down our lives in service to others, And we've got it mixed up. Jesus says the greatest commandment is loving God and loving others. That's the focus. Loving God and loving others. Jesus calls us to lay down our lives. And that's not easy. But it's the model that he leaves for us. It's what he does here. It's what he calls us to. He tells us, anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me. We don't have a choice. This is the direction of Jesus. That we too would be willing to lay down our lives. That others would know God's love and grace and salvation. Let us pray. God, thank you for modeling this command for us because it is so counterintuitive. It's so countercultural. We live in a world that says number one is first. What I think is how, how everybody else has to think. It's all about me, 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 me. And you call us to just the opposite. So God, help us, to, help us to be captivated by what you say and what you think of us, of how you see us, so that we can have the courage and strength to follow this direction and lay our lives down for others. Lord, help me in this area. Help our church, help each one here in this room and watching online. Show us what that looks like in each of our lives, in those areas where where maybe we've gotten things a little bit uh, out of adjustment and we've we've moved a little bit too far in, in protecting what's mine and what is ours instead of laying ourselves down. God, forgive us for that. Give us humility to recognize where that is in our lives and courage to to make the adjustments and to change so that your kingdom goes forward in the way that you modeled. 
Lord Jesus, help us to lay ourselves down on behalf of the gospel, on behalf of the kingdom of God, on behalf of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And through our lives, Lord, would you bring a multitude of people into your kingdom. Would our lives become like that grain of wheat that given in surrender to you produces a hundredfold fruits, people coming to faith, growing in faith, discipled in the way of Jesus. For your glory, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.